Welcome back to the Fox Robbins Business Show. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, we've got a, a topic today to talk about, you know, being a CEO, a CEO or president, same thing. Yeah, I guess, well, I mean, yes and no. Yes and no. CEOs okay. sometimes are uh, being the head of a, of the a, boss and of a small business, whether that's a, uh, uh, a business that's being planned or it's in a startup mode or it's been going for a while. There's still uh, essential points. In fact, we've got 14 ways to be a great, a great startup CEO or business, small business CEO. And this is the Fox Robbins Business Show. And I'm co-host uh, Bill Fox, and the other co-host is none other than the illuminating Cliff Robbins. <laughs> illuminating, thank you. <laughs> Always illuminating. And uh, so we want to get, uh, Coach, we want to get right into this. Uh, we've got a lot of points to make. Yeah, we do. About being a CEO. And I think that the, uh, the first one we start off with is the wider, what you might call the wider scope, which is if you're a CEO, be the keeper of the company vision. That sounds a little grandiose, but wh what do you make of that, Coach? Well, anybody who starts a business has to have a vision for where they see the opportunity, see the uh, problem, see that their solution is the best solution, and and believe in uh, the vision that they have at the company. A great, as it says, a great startup CEO will often judge upcoming initiatives, see if they fit in with where uh, the larger puzzle, puzzle uh, of where this company is going to go and grow. Without a vision, you don't have a company. I mean, everybody uh, starts a business because they have an idea, also known as a vision. They want to start the business and uh, they know that uh, they're going to work hard and build it and they have to be consistent and persistent and stick with it, but utter utterly keep the vision in your mind foremost. Okay. It also says, uh, point number two is that, it says that as a CEO, you have to absorb pain for the team. <laughs> how, did, how did you react to that one? That's well, that's a good one because that's absolutely the truth. There will be pain, especially in a startup. A startup CEO, as it says, needs to be a, uh, a voodoo doll for the startup. You've got to take all the pins and keep it away from the rest of your team. Uh, taking a strong burden of stress, pain, and torture, um, keeping your team uh, inoculated or insulated from that stuff and all at the same time remaining calm and level-headed and making good decisions. This basically speaks to the fact that a good CEO period, but especially in a startup, has good emotional intelligence that they're able to see, keep the vision in mind as we said before, and there's going to be knocks, there's going to be pain, uh, take that pain absorb it, try to insulate to some degree your team from it so that they can continue to do the job of executing uh, everything that needs to be done to keep going towards the vision that you had originally you for want, the You want know, anyone who's working for you or with you, you want them to have a positive or good attitude. You want them always you. to have a positive attitude. You don't have to, you know, not be truthful with them, and that, that's a horrible mistake, but like I say, when things are going badly, uh, Take the fall for it, you know, that's, that's the job. You Take know, the arrows the in the chest. Yeah, the <laughs> arrows in the back, uh, you, you know, the two arrows in the back while you're crawling through the gutter of broken glass, uh, that's the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> next, uh, the next issue is uh, find the smartest people <laughs> and defer on domain experience. That's, that's a computer talk, but I mean, it, uh, if you find smart people, uh, emphasize people who have expertise, perhaps that you don't. Maybe you know, and well, that, but that add to the right. add to the overall effort. Absolutely. I mean, find the smartest people. I mean, I never had a problem finding smarter people than I, but <laughs> I have a unique ability to you know find smart people. Um, find the smartest people and let them do their job. Nobody can do everything. Nobody knows everything. Nobody has all the skills. Nobody has all the tools. You have to know yourself. You uh, have to understand what your strengths are and what your personal weaknesses are. And you need to find people who can mitigate your weaknesses. You may not be good in marketing. You may be a great product design development guy, or you might be great at developing an organization, but that doesn't mean you're great at marketing. 
you may not be the best with the financial side of the business. And Administrat that's administrative issues. Administrative yeah. issues. I am yeah. not good. I was never allowed to touch paperwork in any of my companies. <laughs> uh, I had people who would rip paper out of my hand and say, don't you dare give that to him. He's only going to lose it. Uh, I had my skills. And when it comes to deferring to domain, don't be a micromanager. You've hired good people. You need to trust those people. You need to, to empower those people to do that job. They're going to make mistakes. That's where you have to absorb some of that pain for them. They're going to make mistakes, and, and that's okay, as long as they're not devastating mistake. Uh, and it says a startup CEO has a great knack for finding, a good startup CEO has a great knack for finding the right people and putting them in the right spot that they can be successful. If you get people and you put them in the wrong spot and they fail, that's your mistake. Yeah. You know, like when I get married, my best friend said to my wife, look at, um, he's a bright guy, but don't let him touch power tools because it's just <laughs> not what he does great. So, you know, when it comes to- Even though he sells them. <laughs> I, say I can sell them, but I just can't use them. I'm just not very handy you know, mechanically. So, I mean, nobody has all the skills. Next one is, um, this is interesting, is, is that as a good CEO, you must be a, a good link mm -hmm. uh, between your company or organization and investors. Absolutely. Um, now, there's two ways, well, more than two ways, but certainly the two major ways of getting money for a business is, number one, borrowing it. And startups, uh, banks aren't crazy about doing startups, particularly high-tech startups. They're not really uh, crazy about doing startups, period. In certain industries, they flat out stay away from. But a, a, a company with great growth potential that goes out and gets an equity investor, um, those investors want to be kept up to date. Good startup CEOs stay in touch with their investors, let them know how things are going, and in a few slides we'll talk about what the benchmarks are and how they're being achieved, or if they're not being achieved, how they're going to fix it and achieve it. Uh, there are good, uh, good links between progress issues and areas where they may need more help from the investors. Well, and so, sometimes you have good news to report. Other times it's not so good. Or and then when it's bit, not maybe so, a little bit painful. It can be painful. Then again, that's absor absorbing some of the pain for the company, even with the investors. But the investors want to know uh, how safe is their investment and how's it going and are they going to get to where they want, which is they're already richer. They wouldn't be an investor. Yeah. And how are they going to get richer? That's what they want to know. Well, the next... The next issue with the CEO, uh, it's always this one. This one always relates in my mind to that Steve Jobs story. You know, at, at Apple, is kind of a big, high-profile deal. Yeah, is B the CEO has to be a good link between the company and the product, yep. so to speak. Mm. And that's what when Jobs left Apple, they didn't. They lost that mm. that uh, the connection. Yep. And he came back, and then bingo, you've got the smartphone and the tablet and the, yep. all the other you know, good stuff because he, uh, he had link with product, I yep. guess, is that? He had link and he had, he had vision. Um, you know, he, he, uh, he envisioned people using products that people didn't even know we wanted. I didn't know anything about a smartphone. To me, a phone was a phone. Uh, of course, today, you know, I always say to my students, particularly, I say, you know, this thing's still a phone. Don't forget, you can make calls on it. Besides doing email, besides texting. listening to your, you uh, yeah, you texting. besides texting, besides <laughs> yahooing, besides you know, uh, checking out restaurants yeah. that you want to go to yeah. or getting directions, it is a telephone. But Steve Jobs was a visionary, obviously, and uh, a great marketing guy. And yes, uh, he was a very difficult uh, person to work for. He drove people hard. That's why the board of directors got rid of him, quite frankly, because he was rather irascible but demanding and uh, had great vision, knew what the products that people would want would be. And, you know, when he came back, when he was brought back, Apple was within, like, weeks of bankruptcy. And he came back in. And, oh, was that uh, close? Oh yeah, they were close. They were really close. And he came back and he wanted to protect his own investment, his own stocks in Apple. And of course, he got Bill Gates to loan him 150 million. A lot of people <laughs> don't know that. And uh, and he did save the company. He he came up with the ideas that said, you know, geez, we have technology, but 
how can we combine those technologies to come up with a great new product? He had a vision for a product in his soul, and he, and he, he obviously, he built, and don't forget, he did it all while he knew he had pancreatic cancer. He did all that in the mm. latter stage of, when he came back in the later part of his yeah, career. Right. But his link between Apple and the products he wanted to sell were all new products, which was made Apple at the time of his passing or shortly after, the most valuable company on the planet. It surpassed all other companies as far as, far as uh, capital value goes. Close, but he was close to the product, man. He kept he, that. The product was him. I mean, he, uh, he wanted a screen that wouldn't scratch. He was very demanding. He, mm -hmm. he, wanted, he wanted the right things in that product, and obviously he was right. The, uh, ne the next point for CEOs is uh, be able to learn on the job. I mean, uh, that's a be flexible or be open-minded, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I guess, uh, you know, and, and be uh, willing to learn on the job. I mm -hmm. guess that's what that means, Coach. Absolutely. Absolutely. You wanna, you're you going to be learning all the time, particularly uh, as a startup CEO. You're in a new business. Uh, the best have the ability to learn as they go. They, they have the blinders off. They're open-minded. They've hired the best people, as we say. They're listening to these people. Uh, they have certain persistence in certain areas, but they're also listening and open-minded. Things are going to happen that you didn't expect. All right? This is why an investor, and we've said this, I've said this in many shows before, an investor will bet on a class A team mm -hmm. before they'll bet on a class B team with a class A idea. And the reason being, things, even though they're planned out, aren't going to go that way. And so the CEO and all of the C-level executives, the, the COO, the chief marketing officer, the chief operating officer, all those people, have to be aware of what's happening with the company and make adjustments, pivot is the word we use in business, as you're going along, make the changes that are necessary to stay on track and make this thing a success. All with the original vision in mind, but how you're going to get there will change as you go forward. Okay. Uh, this next point, uh, you know, I wanna hear what you have to say. It, uh, uh, the, you, you almost maybe would say no, no experience, almost preferred. I mean, uh, it's that's almost like it's like uh, uh, you could come into the job of CEO knowing too much in a way, or, or mm -hmm. having too much bias or too much uh, foreknowledge. I mean, you you uh, you want to be, uh, uh, you know, sometimes be better to start kind of with a blank slate, as the author says. Well, this uh, I, I this is the one slide that I had a problem with. Um, no experience. If he didn't put in the word almost, I'd have a real problem with it <laughs> because it flies in the face of. I do want somebody who is an experienced CEO to lead my company, quite frankly, but. I don't want somebody who can't do the previous slide, which is to be able to learn on the job that has blinders on and say, we always did it this way. That can be a mistake. Yeah. This situation may change. You have to learn. And having too much experience, uh, if you're going to get stuck on that experience, I mean, GE was, uh, you know, would have people that became CEOs of so many other companies. They didn't have experience maybe in the product of the other company necessarily, mm. but they did have experience as leaders, as managers, mm. as, the, as, as people who could motivate, people that were trustworthy, people that were, could communicate. Those are very important skills. Mm. And yeah, I mean, you don't necessarily have to have the deep technical skills to go back to Steve Jobs. He wasn't a software engineer. That was Wozniak and so many other people. He, Bill Gates was a software engineer, but Steve Jobs couldn't program anything. So, you know, he had no experience doing that, but he knew what he wanted from the market standpoint. So, uh, this one is kind of a touchy one. No experience, almost preferred. Sometimes it's better to have a blank slate. Uh, not a totally blank slate. You know, yeah. I don't want somebody coming in and never built a company before. I want somebody coming in with the right tools that can come in, keep an open mind, and know where they want to take this particular company based on the vision and the products that they're developing. <laughs> okay. Uh, and that CEO, that, the next point that the CEO 
has to have like an uncanny ability to say no. Mm -hmm. How did you take? How did you? What was your take on that one? Absolutely. You, this, you one, like this, that one? this one, I'm 100 percent for. <laughs> the last one, I wasn't totally, totally for. You have to have the ability to say no. You're going to have a lot of people coming at you with ideas, with requests, and you just can't take them all and say yes, yes, yes. You can't be a yes man, not even to the investors. You have to be. You're going to be inundated with ideas, right? You're going to be inundated with, with ideas from your investors but especially your employees, who, like I say, are smarter than you in some areas, but they may not see the whole picture. You as the CEO have to see the whole picture. You know, not just the marketing piece, not just the financial piece, not just the R&D piece, not just the human resource piece. You have to understand how all those pieces get together. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the marketing people, well, a lot of times the marketing people are fighting with the financial people. You know, and you've got to be, as the CEO, be able to say to somebody, I, yeah, I, I hear you, but my answer is no, okay? Now we're going to continue on this particular track. And th sometimes it's hard to say no to somebody you respect that, you know, but it just doesn't fit with the big picture. That person also deserves to have an explanation, in my opinion, which goes beyond this particular slide, yeah. of why you're saying no to yeah. them, okay? How it does not fit with where you see the company. Hey, the buck stops at, at your desk. You're the CEO of the company, and you've got to be able to say no as well as yes, or the company's going to be in trouble. Well, and sometimes that no is maybe not not exactly no, but no, not now too. I mean, a time like it could be suggestions or ideas coming could be a timing issue, not like it's no good. We're not going to do it, but yep. maybe we we need we need to take that up, but at a at a better time. You know, Timing is a huge, huge issue. It's an issue, quite frankly, that I've done some research into. And a lot, a lot of people have said, I, I saw a wonderful TED talk where uh, the gentleman who was a, an angel a VC, angel investor, if you will, and he looked at a couple of constructs to successful startups, mm -hmm. and particularly technology startups, and they looked at uh, the timing of the introduction of a product, they looked at the team, they looked at the financing behind it, and surprisingly, we've always said the team is number one, team is number one. Well, their investments, he said, timing is really number one. Timing was ahead of even of the team. And sometimes, like you say, somebody comes to you with an idea, it's not the right time. It's, it's just not, yeah. so you've got to say no. Right. But, We'll keep it on the back burner because you know what? That might be something for us to look at next year or the year after. But for right now, the answer is no. It's a very short word, but sometimes it's hard for CEOs to say. You want to keep these people happy. It's, it's hard to say no to somebody and still keep them motivated sometime. And that's, that's the trick. That's tricky. Yeah, it is tricky, but it has to be done. That, uh, the next point, the CEO... Uh, must have some technical knowledge somewhere, a mm -hmm. skill set mm -hmm. somewhere in there. Yeah. Well, when you say technical knowledge, I mean, uh, that doesn't mean they have to be a, uh, a, a programmer. If it's uh, like, a Steve, like I said well, about again, Steve Jobs. Well, again, Steve Jobs, Jobs didn't, he didn't know how to wire a, you know, a, a, bo a, a no hard idea. board a or, or, pro or program or thing. Uh, no, printed circuit, not printed circuit. personal computer. But yeah. no, he didn't have a clue how to wire a printed circuit board. And I don't remember how to do it anymore either. I used to sit there and do that stuff, but that was a long time ago. Uh, no, he, he, the technical skills required of somebody at a supervisory management level are very high. But as that person moves up the ladder to become a C-level executive, the technical skills become less and less important. And the personal and personnel and emotional skills and management and leadership skills become huge. And I don't care if it's a technology company, I don't care if it's a retail store, I don't care if it's a restaurant, those leadership skills, those management skills become huge. Uh, you know, there are a lot of great cooks that can't run a restaurant because they just can't lead people, they just, but yeah. you leave them in the kitchen and they're okay. <laughs> so technical skills get smaller as far as a requirement goes as a person moves up the ladder in a corporation. Right. And so CEOs need to understand the basic technical requirements. Even when you take a, a potential CEO from GE and you take them into your company, they may not be uh, familiar with your particular products. They can learn the products pretty quickly, okay? 
but it takes a long time to develop all the other sea level skills that are required to lead a company uh, to the promised land. Okay. The, uh, the next point about uh, the CEO is that he, he or she must be able to break things down into sizable chunks and, uh, and milestones. Mm -hmm. does, does that ring a bell with you? Oh, absolutely. That one I agree with. What can you do first with what you've got, you know? <laughs> here's where we are, here's the plan, here's the one-year plan, here's the five-year plan, three-year plan, and here's how we see this company's gonna go. When you go to an investor and you say to the investor, I need, uh, you know, $500,000, and uh, at the end of six months we'll be here, and at the end of the year we'll be there, and if we are there, we're gonna need another million and a half to take us over the next hurdles as the company continues to grow. Mm -hmm. So you're breaking down your progress into bite-sized chunks to be able to say, A, here are the benchmarks that we're going to achieve, mm -hmm. and that's all part of smart management, specific, we've gone through that before, specific, mm -hmm. measurable, measurable, attainable, attainable. responsible, mm -hmm. and timely, by when? And that's what this is talking about, breaking things down into chunks and milestones. It's one thing to have the BHAG, if uh, you remember BHAG, yeah. big, hairy, audacious goal. That's the <laughs> vision. That's where I see this company. That's the gentleman, I don't remember the Japanese name, but standing in his bombed out factory saying, you know, start, his company was his name Honda, you've heard of them, <laughs> saying our goal will be to be the best engine makers in the world. And quite frankly, Honda makes good engines. One of the best ads I ever saw was the guy gets in his Honda, drives to the boat yard, jumps on his boat, starts yeah. up his oh, Honda yeah. engines, <laughs> goes to his island, starts up his Honda generator, <laughs> goes out to his Honda mower and starts mowing his grass. Honda makes great engines. So that, that was their big, hairy, audacious goal, but it's broken down into bite-sized chunks so that you can feel good about achieving, you know, the, the goals along the way. You gotta go to first base before you run home. Uh -huh. And that's the bottom line. First, second, third, then home. Okay. <laughs> but along the way, as you're going along the way, the next point is you must have the ability to call an audible. I like that. That's a uh, football, that's like a football analogy. Well, that's a perfect analogy because you know what? Uh, here you are, you've got the play. In the old days, of course, the quarterback called the play and therefore the quarterback back then had more ability to call an audible because he's the one calling the play in the first place. But here you are, you're on the, uh, the, the one yard line of the other team yeah. and uh, you know, you're gonna try to slam your big back into the line but they right. load up nine in the box with 300 <laughs> pounders and you say, well that's just not gonna work. You step up to the line and you see, hey, this isn't gonna work. Maybe we better change it right here. Yeah. And you know, somebody starts hollering the, the magic phrase, whether it's a color or a word that says, hey, I'm changing the play right. and here's the new play. And uh, because we got a better chance of being successful with the new play. So yeah, CEOs come up against all kinds of things that are just unexpected, and you have to be able to pivot again, make a change, call an audible, and try to score the touchdown. <laughs> the, uh, the next point, the CEO must motivate uh, the team through despair, through, that's issues of despair mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, yeah. or despairing moments and so forth. That's probably true, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, this is, goes back to number one to me, number one in uh, the voodoo doll one, where he's taking the hit, taking the yeah, pain. Yeah. This is the same thing, quite frankly. It's right. almost a duplicate. Right. I keep trying to reduce it to 12 or 13. But <laughs> yeah, this is to me a duplicate. CEOs motivate the team yeah. to keep their chin up that, you know, things are look a little difficult right now. And this is all part of management, the ability to recognize that things, uh, you know, aren't going real well right now. Well, what are we going to do about it? This is management, planning, organizing, staffing, leading, and controlling. Controlling meaning, here's what we thought was going to happen. It's not happening. Well, what are you going to do about it? If you don't do anything different, then you're going to get the same darn results. So you have to sit there with your emotional intelligence, working with your team, and saying, here's what's happening. It's not good. What are we going to do about it? Well, they did it at Apple. To go back to Apple, they called Steve Jobs back. Otherwise, they would have been bankrupt. Apple would have yeah. been bankrupt within months. Uh, all of what you just said that feeds into the next point, which is be a be a great communicator if you can, or mm -hmm. you must. You must. This is the single most important one. This is what leaders do. They are great communicators. Whether it's FDR 
or uh, who was the guy in England there, Winston something? Winston Churchill. Churchill. Yeah, Winston he was Churchill. a great communicator <laughs> too. But I mean, any great leader is a great communicator. They have to be, it starts with slide number one, which was creating a vision right. and, and letting people buy into your vision and being able to uh, portray the necessary energy and the passion that you feel and have other people take on that passion and say, I love what this guy's saying. I love the potential that this company has. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be the next Facebook or Apple. It can be just a, a simple plumbing business, a retailer, or any small business. They, they, they just really believe in what they're doing and they're going to pass that energy on to uh, everybody else through communication. That's great. And the, the final point uh, on this set, Coach, is that don't be a fake, don't be a fake CEO. Mm -hmm. But this is very similar to what Bill Parcells, to get back to a, uh, a football analogy, yeah. don't be a fake quarterback or a, a TV personality type quarterback. Yeah. You're here to play football, you're here to learn, uh, don't get all caught up in uh, all the glorious and the glory and the TV and the hype and everything. And uh, this is the same type of thing. In short, worry about things that are going to produce results with your company. And the fame will come. Don't worry just, I want to be famous, I want to be a hero, I want to look good all the time. You're not going to, okay? But it's it's when things are difficult that you step up to the plate that you really do start to look good. You've come a long way. Yeah. And so you don't want to be a fake. You want to be sincere about it. And again, it goes back to the, the quarterback situation. Quarterbacks come into the league and all of a sudden they become fake quarterbacks. They'd rather be a star than work their butt off and be a real solid quarterback and take the team. To oh, the they have that in Cleveland, I believe. They have it in uh, Cleveland. They had it in Tony Romo until he got his act together, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the things Parcells told him. Don't be a fake quarterback. <laughs> Thank you for watching the Fox Robbins Business Show again. Uh, we're talking about uh, 14 ways to be a great startup CEO, and we'll cover uh, other issues in, in future episodes. And uh, feel free to send us comments uh, at foxrobbins at gmail.com. That's foxrobbins at gmail.com. Right, I got Whatever it. ideas you've got. It's on my card. <laughs> Whatever ideas or thoughts or comments that you have, please send them to us. And thank you again. We'll see you next time.